What a crazy question to ask someone who's been lying there for 38 years, who's crippled, and who clearly desires to walk. So I begin to pray about this, like, Lord, why did you ask this question? Like, obviously, this man wants to get healed. But then you see in the next verse, what is his response? Sir, there's no way I can get healed. Stopped right there. He has identified himself as a victim to his circumstance above Jesus that's standing right in front of him. He, his identity has become his circumstance and his crippleness. So why did Jesus ask him if he wanted to get well? He identified the victimization that this person identified with. Victimization will block you from what God has for you every single time. What we say must match what we believe. In counseling, we have this technique called a challenging question. You don't use it often, but it's when you challenge someone and ask them when they say one thing, but they do another. We see in this man in John chapter 5 that he's at the pool. He wants to be healed. He's talking to Jesus. But then as soon as Jesus asked, do you truly long to be well? He answered, there's no way I can be healed. So while he was at the pool and he's been there for 38 years, his actions actions say, I want to get healed, but his words say otherwise. That is a pit of victimization. You say you follow Jesus, but your, your words follow something else your identity begins to shift a big part of being a victim is having excuses as to why you can't be healed particularly excuses about other people what does this guy say I can't be healed and I have no one to lower me into the water when the angel comes as soon as I try to crawl to the edge of the pool someone else jumps ahead of me Victimization will cause you to put others in front of your glory and everything God has for you when they have nothing to do with it. God has made a way in your own path. He has made a way for every one person individually. As soon as you start blaming others, you start pointing fingers, you completely stop stop yourself from the flow of the Holy Spirit, from the glory of God, from the healing of God. We cannot become a victim to our circumstance. And then there's so much in this, in this verse right here. Go back to verse 6. This question, do you truly long to be well? I was just like so baffled by this question. So I pulled up Pastor Jonathan and I looked it up, what it said in the Greek. And this word long to be well, right here it's, it's a future tense. So do you want to be healed? As in, in the future. The Greek uses something called an eris middle infinitive tense. This tense simply refers to a single, completed, not ongoing action in the past. Arist is used to describe an action happening in the present, usually to emphasize its certainty. So a better, way, a better translation would be, are you convinced that you have already been made whole? So why is Jesus asking this guy, do you want to be healed? He is really saying, he's checking his faith. He said, do you truly long and to truly believe that you have been made whole already. The action is already, should not be in front, but faith is right now. See, sometimes in English we confuse the word hope and faith and we just interchange them. That's not true. Hope is something we see for in the future. Faith is something right now that has happened. So Jesus really asks him, Are you convinced that you've already been made whole? He is challenging his victimization and he is challenging his faith. 
In order to be healed, we must forfeit our early identity. Faith is what God has gifted you as an identity. To be saved, you have faith. We have never, with our five senses, never seen God, never touched God. With our five senses, we have never experienced God, yet we know him. It is by faith that we are saved, and in the same way, by faith, we are healed. Faith is believing what you have prayed for is already done. What's interesting is this guy has been here for 38 years, and that's about the same time the Israelites were in the desert. And you see a parallel there with a lack of faith and causing them for what should have been a short journey to be 38 years. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, hallelujah. Amen. The technology talks back tonight. You can just close it. See, if I was, I was, if I was religious, I said the demon is trying to speak to me through the computer. <laughs> this man has been there for 38 years. That's about the same time as the Israelites. And what we see in both those stories is a lack of faith. The Israelites... They see the giants. They, see, they start to see themselves as grasshoppers. And instead of acting on what God had already promised them, what they, God had already guaranteed them, the promised land, is literally called the promised land. It's already yours. They go fleeing. They run away. And then they're caught in this loop because of their own victimization. It is by faith that we receive these things, that we acknowledge the work that has already been completed. The work has already been done on the cross, 100%. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. And put this in the Amplified, if you will. Now, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. Who can tell me what a title deed is? A title deed means you own it. You no longer have to work for it. It's not something that I'm paying off. It's something that's mine. It's in my name. Ownership has been transferred to me. Faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see. That's our five physical senses. Have we ever seen God? touch God? Has God ever touched us physically? No. Yet we believe him. Our foundation is on him. It is, through, it, is through, it is by faith that we receive him. Not by things seen, but by, by things claimed, by faith. This whole chapter of Hebrews is just... Turn to verse 3. By faith... That is with an inherent trust and enduring confidence. Mine is a little bit different. By faith, we understand that the worlds during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose. By the word of God, so that, we, so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. So this shows that God himself established the law of faith. God, he did what in the beginning? He spoke the world into existence, saying, light be, and light was. 
He spoke words as if it was already there and it happened. That's how faith works. Just as we receive, Lord, Lord, I thank you that you are in, in my heart. You have saved me. We are saved. The same thing happens with healing. It's all by faith. We claim the work that has already been completed, our healing that has already been completed on the cross, and therefore we walk out our healing. Not as something we hope for, but as something that has already happened. I gave a, like a five minute version of the sermon to the young adults and I told them this analogy. It's kind of like if you saw a guy pull up, let's say you're out with your buddies, you saw a guy pull up in a yellow Ferrari. He gets out, he's got a Tom Ford suit on, he's got a Rolex, right? You say, wow, this guy's rich. You go to your buddies and say, today I saw a rich man. They said, how did you know? What are you going to tell them? You're going to tell him about the evidence of what he demonstrated. You're going to say he drove a yellow Ferrari. He wore a Tom Ford suit. He had this Rolex on. Are those really things that establish his wealth? Those are evidence of the wealth. In the same way, when someone is healed, we are now seeing the evidence of the healing that has already taken place 2,000 years ago. In the same analogy, the money has already been put in your account. The healing has already taken place. You no longer have to work for it. The faith is our title deed of things that have promised that are not visible, visible to the physical senses. You do not have to work to establish money in order to get the Ferrari, to get your healing. The healing has already been paid for 100%. The work is finished. In the same chapter, turn to verse 13. I'm sorry, 14. Now those people who talk as they did show plainly that they are in search of a fatherland, their own country. Next verse. If they had been thinking with homesick remembrance of that country from which they were immigrants, they would have found constant opportunity to return it, to it. So what does this mean? They abandon their old identity and completely em embrace their new identity God has given them by faith. If they were th had been thinking of what they used to have, they would have found constant opportunity to go back to it. I have this saying that if you look for something hard enough, you'll find it, even if it's not true. If you keep holding on to that, what, we, what, what Pastor talked about last week, that mixture, you have faith, but you mix it with something else. Com not completely abandoning your old identity. You begin to dilute the power of faith. And you will find constant opportunity to return to it. And let's drop down. I'll just read this actually. This whole book of Hebrews 11 chapter explains the faith of stories in the Bible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was caught up and transfigured. By faith, Abraham, he was called by God and obeyed by going to a place to receive his inheritance. By faith, he lived as a foreigner in a promised land. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive. These stories are not just, they happen to be the right place, right time. These stories could have gone another way, but they accepted what by faith they could not see. What was true in the spiritual realm, they accepted it in the physical, 
and they begin to turn it true. We cannot always be so focused on our physical senses. We say, I do not feel God. I do not see God. I do not see the manifestation of God in my life. I do not feel the manifestation of God in my life. None of that matters. It is by faith that we claim these things, just like how you were saved. It is by faith that we adopt our new identity, our new home, our new country of heaven. We, claim the, we begin to claim the principles of heaven. The Bible calls Jesus the perfecter, the finisher of faith. Meaning what? The work of faith is completed. Everything, every healing you ever need, the healing I need yesterday, the healing I need today, the healing I need 20 years from now, all has been paid for 2,000 years ago on the cross. I, I feel like sometimes people can get prayed for and they get in this mindset of God needs to do something more. I come up here and I need to get prayed for and God has to do something. Everything that needs to be done has already been done. The ball is in your court. There is nothing else God has to do. Heaven does not have to move to you to get healed. The finished work of Christ guarantees our healing that it is already paid for. And then by faith, we receive that healing. Are you convinced that you have already been made whole? That is how healing happens. We begin to accept what has been already paid for 2,000 year, years, years ago. One of the biggest lies you can believe is that God has to do something on top of everything he's already done. By faith, we accept what is already true in the spiritual and pull it into the physical. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. And we can go back to the Passion Translation. We have the same spirit of faith that is described in the scriptures when it says, first I believed, then I spoke in faith. So we also first believe, then speak in faith. How do we speak? We speak in faith. Notice how the first story in John chapter 5, he asks this man, do you want to be made whole? What does the man do? He speaks Lord, there, it is impossible that I can get healed. Your words carry more weight than you think they do. God created the world with his words. He said, light be and light was. That is a principle of faith, and he spoke it through words. Drop down to verse 18. Because we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but the unseen realm is eternal. I know this can be hard to comprehend at times because everything that human makes, a human makes, has a beginning and an end. But with God, is only eternal. Everything he established lasts forever. So Jesus dying on the cross, paying the price for our sins, paid it all. Every sin. The sin I need, the sin I need redemption for, the sin you need the redemption for, the healing I need, the healing that you need tomorrow, 20 years from now, the healing of cancer, the healing of a cold nose, it doesn't matter. It all has been paid for already. So we look not at the physical senses, but we look at what is true in the spiritual. In other words, I may be experiencing symptoms I may be experiencing physical abnormalities, but I know that in the spiritual realm, the price of that debt of the healing has already been paid for. I do not need God to move out of heaven. I do not need God to cast lightning down and something magical to happen. The price of your debt of your healing has already been paid for. The money is already in your account. The ball is in your court. We receive by faith 
what is in the spiritual realm and you begin to pull it into the physical. I lo- this is about prosperity, but I love that testimony my dad gives about he was believing for a certain amount of money. And he began to print out what fake, just paper, $100 bills. And he had this little stack of, I mean, just print paper, $100 bills. I mean, nothing was on the back, it's just on the front. And he began to visualize the exact amount of money that he needed. What is he doing? He's establishing what is true in the spiritual and begins to manifest it in the physical. It's amazing to me that when you listen to these really rich guys, they aren't Christian at all. And they give these, you know, how they got rich and these, you can go on YouTube and find them. These how to, you know, think like a rich man. What do they say? I be, they, all, all of them begin, have some type of pulling what they believe and what they want into the physical long before they actually see it. They begin to believe they have something long before they actually see it. Why does that work for them? Because God created this principle that what we see and what we establish in the spiritual world begins to shift into the physical. We have been made in the image and likeness of God. Just how God spoke the world to be, we can begin to speak our own reality into existence. That's why the Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. You see this guy in John chapter 5, his actions say he wants to be healed by being at the side of the pool, but his words say, Lord, it is impossible for me to get healed. We cannot base our beliefs on what we see in the physical. That's why the word becomes our daily bread. Let's turn to John 11 and verse 41. This is the story of Lazarus. And you could spend a long time in this chapter, but Let's go to verse 41. So Lazarus dies, and Jesus finally goes to see him. And basically... Everyone is like hating on Jesus. They said, if you would have only just come earlier, Lazarus would have been healed. He wouldn't have been dead. Now he's been in the tomb for four days. He stinks. There's a big stone. It's over. But Jesus says in this moment that things can't be done your way. Things are done my way. Sometimes we get in the way of our own blessing. That's a whole different message. But in our healing, we think that things have to be done a certain way. We put limits on God. And sometimes you put a limit on God and you want him to come like this, but God's this big. So he never comes that way. You say, why did that happen? We cannot limit God's power the way God wants to do things. If God wants you to go jump in a river seven times and you'll be healed, why don't you just go do it? Establish what is already true in the spiritual. Claim it, and it becomes true in the physical. Look at what he says in verse 41. So, he ro- so they rolled away this heavy stone. Jesus gazed into heaven and said, before, before we say what Jesus said, this is a perfect example of how to pray for things not yet seen. What does he say? Father, thank you that you have heard my prayer. Verse 42. For you listen to every word I speak. Now so that these who stand here with me will believe that you have sent me to earth as your messenger, I will use the power you have given me. 
Then with a loud voice, Jesus shouted with authority, Lazarus, come out of that tomb. So how does Jesus pray here? He thanks God for the completed work that is not yet seen in the physical. We begin to see that Jesus has claimed this and he knows what it be true in the spiritual. Lazarus is just sleeping. Why would he say Lazarus is sleeping? If he did that at, you know, my uncle's funeral, I'd be, I'd be very upset. Jesus, you're being rude. You're saying he's sleeping. He's been dead for four days. By this time, his body's decomposing. Why does he say he's sleeping? Is he trying to be disrespectful? Jesus has already claimed what is true in the, in the spiritual. So all the other people, they're looking at the physical. Lazarus is in a tomb. He's dead. He's been dead for four days. Jesus knows that in the spiritual, Lazarus is not yet dead. <coughs> Lazarus might be dead in the physical, but in the spiritual, Lazarus is still alive. The resurrection power is in Jesus. He never claimed that Lazarus was dead. Lazarus was true, and he began to bring it into the physical. I love this verse right here because he basically says in verse 42 that you listen to every word that I speak. And I'm basically only saying these things out loud so the people around me can hear them. Because I know you hear every word that I speak. I know these things are already true. But I'm saying this to the benefit of those who are around me. And then with his words, he says, Lazarus, come out of that tomb. In this Lazarus story, you also have people that doubt Jesus. <coughs> you have people that want to do things their way. When God says, I am the only way, the truth and the light. In your healing, you may have people around you that don't understand what you're doing. You're going to begin to say things that to them are not true. Lazarus is sleeping. No, he's not. He's been dead for four days. But we do not operate in the physical realm, but the spiritual. We claim the finished work that has happened 2,000 years ago. I like what my dad said last week. We must maintain focus. We cannot have a mixture of faith and unbelief. It requires focus. Our healing does not come from wavering one place to another, but by knowing, being convinced that we are already made whole, not by our physical senses, but by what the Bible says, but by this fin the finished work of Jesus Christ. We must do it Jesus' way. You know, King David, before he was king, he, he faces Goliath. That's one, another one of my favorite stories. And he basically goes to the camp where his three older brothers were staying at the camp just to bring bread and cheese. And then he sees Goliath, and then he begins to say, I can take this guy. He's disrespecting my God. And then everyone around him, especially his brothers, basically say, you're dumb, what are you doing? You shouldn't even be here, you need to leave. But David remains in what God had told him. See, David had already had experiences with adversity. Let's turn there actually. Let's go back to the Amplified, 1 Samuel, chapter 17, I believe. First Samuel 17, and let's go down to verse 34. So David decides to face this guy, Goliath. 
And then King Saul, let's start at verse 33, 1 Samuel 17, 33. Then Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight for him, for you are only a young man, and he has been a warrior since his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock. I went after it and attacked it and rescued the lamb out of its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I seized it by its whiskers and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Since he has taunted and defied the armies of the living God, verse 37, David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go and may the Lord be with you. And what is David saying here? That because of David's, because of what God has already brought David through, David now has the faith to claim the victory over Goliath before it even happens. You can easily argue that if David had chickened out over fighting the, fighting the lion and fighting the bear, he would not have the courage, he would not have the faith to face Goliath in this moment. The lesson here is that these little victories that we have throughout our journey, that little cold that you may have, that little sniffle, that little sign of COVID, whatever, we begin to claim our healing and act it out. And we build up faith just like David when he faces Goliath. Because eventually one day you will be in a serious situation where it would no longer be a cold it might be something more serious. Or for, for someone else, let's say someone in, your friend ends up in the hospital. All of a sudden you begin freaking out because you've never established and never worked your faith. You've never experienced healing in your own life. So in these, small, in these moments that we think are small, where we're just a little bit sick, where, oh, I'll just be over in two weeks. We need to establish that the healing for it has already been taken place, and we claim it. So when the big event comes up, it is no longer even big to you. You can say, just as David said, the Lord who has delivered me from this back then, and from this back then, he will deliver me from this now. And these past experiences define who I am. And they establish my faith. And I begin to claim what God already has for me. And I begin to claim that God died on a cross 2,000 years ago. And the healing has already taken place. The title deed is mine. I no longer have to work for my healing. I no longer have to work for God to move. The ball is in my court and I begin to claim what God has for us. What is true in the spiritual, I begin to pull into the physical. I begin to claim what is true in the spiritual and not claim what is true in the physical. My five senses I know will deceive me, but I know in the spiritual that he has already claimed my healing. That my healing is here and I cannot abide in here. If I continue to look at my five senses, man, I don't feel good. Man, I may look weird. Man, my hand is whatever. I will continually go back to the homeland. I will continually go back to what I once knew, my old identity. You begin to have that mixture that we talked about last week. But you fully leave your homeland, establish your new identity in Christ, and say, my destiny is heaven. And this world is but a moment in time for my eternity. And I begin to claim what is truly true in the spiritual that God has declared me healed, that God has already provided my healing. And this principle of faith can be applied to prosperity, to healing, to all different areas. But tonight we're focusing on healing as God has died on the cross for us. He has completed the work. He is the perfecter of faith. There is nothing more he has to do. This last point I want to make 
is when David was talking to Saul, Saul tries to give him his armor and basically says, you know, you're just a little kid. I'm going to give you the best armor. It's King Saul. I'm sure he had the best armor money could buy. He's the king. David wears the armor and he can barely move. And he basically says that I can't use this because I'm not used to it. Saul, what you did, I appreciate, but it's not going to bring me through this victory. Because I know that the God who delivered me from the, from the lion and the God who delivered me from the bear is going to deliver me from Goliath. Nothing that you do, Saul. Saul, I appreciate it, but I have to do this God's way. You have to be careful when you're praying for healing that you do not take shortcuts. Take the things people may just even want to give you. Things that are a nice gesture, but we cannot contaminate our mixture of faith. God teaches how to be healed. It's simple. It is not this complicated process where we need God to move and only some people get healed. And we pray hard and we pray for more faith and all this nonsense. The work has already been done. The money is already in your account. The ball is in your court. You begin to claim what God has already done, just how you were saved. That's how you claim your healing. <clears throat> and you begin to establish what is true in the spiritual and pull it into the physical. The finished work of Christ is enough. If you leave here with anything today, leave here with that, that the finished work of Christ is enough. The price on your head, the price on your healing has already been paid for. Your salvation is completed. Your healing is completed. All the healing that you need yesterday, today, 20 years from now. Our healing is in Jesus Christ. We cannot fear our circumstance. We talked about last week, Mark chapter 5. Do not fear, only believe. We cannot contaminate our faith. So what does that mean? Sometimes we have to put some things aside. Sometimes we can't talk to certain people because they're just going to tear us down in what we believe. Sometimes I can't watch certain YouTube videos because I know it would just be a distraction of what I'm going through right now. That does not mean you have to completely give up these people or give up your way of life. But in your moment of, <clears throat> in your moment where you want to be healed, sometimes you have to get focused. Sometimes you have to lose the distractions. You have to be willing to sacrifice your, your way of doing things, the way you think this will go. And you say, Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, I claim what you have for me, what have already been paid for. And Lord, whatever it takes, I claim what you have for me. I claim my healing. And I stand 100% focused. And I stand on that. I stand on that word 100%. And my healing comes. Jesus died on a cross paying our debts of our sins and our healing. He himself carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we would be dead to sin and live for righteousness. Our instant healing flowed from his wounding. By his stripes, we were healed, past tense. The healing is completed. There is no more work that you have to do. Part of me wants to go play the piano and preach at the same time, but. <laughs> the finished work of Jesus Christ lives inside all of us. There is no there is no work that has to be done by Jesus. Everything is completed. The finished work of Jesus Christ happened 2,000 years ago. My healing that I need happened 2,000 years ago. 
And then I begin to claim it and pull it in the physical by faith. Faith is not something we hope for in the future. Faith is something we claim now as something that has already happened. Just bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, I thank you that we have, we are here today to acknowledge your finished work. What you have already done for us, Father. We do not abide by our physical senses, but we claim what is true in the spiritual, that we are already healed. It does not matter our circumstance. It does not matter what we are going through, Father, but you've already provided a way. You've already done the work, Father, and we claim what you have for us. Father, we claim what you have for us. You have done the finished work. Just begin to pray in your own tongues, just for 30 seconds. Just begin to thank him for what he's already accomplished. Begin to thank him for the finished work in your own life. Begin to thank him for the times he has delivered you from your difficulties. Yesterday I was praying for the altar service and I was praying that, Lord, I thank you that you just show up in this altar service. He immediately stopped me and said, he said, I'm already there. I was praying last night that, Lord, you just show up in this altar service. He said, he said I'm already there. God, Jesus is already here right now. He is in the building. If any of you have anything wrong in your physical body, anything wrong any mental illnesses you deal with I just want you to come up and I want to pray for you tonight we claim the finished work of Jesus your healing has already been provided for you the money is already in your account if you need a healing tonight I'll just ask you to come up and I would like to pray for you we're all good let me just say a prayer for all of us tonight Lord I thank you that you have provided a way for us by our faith we claim things that we do not see yet we know are true we claim your lordship we claim your finished work we claim the work you have finished on the cross we claim who you say we are not who we, we, who we may see that we are Lord, I thank you that our words match our actions, that we claim the finished work. We do not let our circumstance become our reality. We do not become a victim of our circumstance. Lord, like David, I thank you that we begin to be healed from these things that we consider small so that when something big, as we consider, comes, that we have the preparedness, that we have the faith, Father. We know that we have the faith because we have already, you've already delivered us, Father, from the past circumstances. Lord, I thank you for your finished work. I thank you for your favor on our lives, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, Pastor will be here uh, next Wednesday, and everyone have a good night. Amen.